Perhaps you were expecting some surprise for me to reveal a secret that had eluded you, something that would change your perspective of events, shatter you to your core. There is no great revelation, no great secret. There is only you. I know it's been a while, but I think the time's right, because a lot of you have been asking for the truth behind Kreia's motives, which I promised in Treya Explained. And if this video does go on to answer your questions, perhaps consider joining the community and subscribing if you haven't. So, even after playing Knights of the Old Republic 2 for god knows how many times, Kreia still fascinates me. She's so mysterious and alluring, and even if you don't fully understand her words, they still stick with you for a long time after playing. You have to listen to every single word to truly understand her position within the story and what she's trying to achieve. It's easy to say she's just a crazy old bat that's speaking nonsense, but that's not true. She's got a goal, she knows what she wants and how to get it. And as you play, it's ultimately down to the player, to you, to piece together Kreia's words, words that are like puzzle pieces, and come up with your own conclusion. But Kreia does have clear motives, that's right, motives within the game, motives that are underlying and clever and something that I don't think everybody got on their first playthrough, I certainly didn't myself. So Kreia's grand master plan was to utilise Echoes. You may have heard the word Echoes a lot when playing KOTOR 2, because the story is about repercussions, it's about how small and big events or actions affect other things. War, destruction, these events leave wounds in the galaxy, in all life. The death of one can send echoes through hundreds, even thousands, across many planets. If not checked, then it spreads until nothing is left. I see the death of the galaxy, of life. But first, I thought it was just conquest, but it's more terrible than that. It's an echo, spreading outwards, killing everything. It's not possible. But to understand the idea of Force Echoes, the easiest thing is to imagine that the Force is like an ocean. It moves naturally, weaving back and forward, affecting everything. Then, imagine that every event of death or destruction that happens is like a rock being thrown into the water, which creates unnatural ripples. And the more death, the more rocks, essentially, are going to create force ripples that affect the natural order of things. These ripples, or echoes as they're called, can be felt by force users as disturbances in the force which can travel and be felt galaxy-wide, and at times the ripples can cause damage and pain. When an event of mass extermination happens, then it's like one massive rock being thrown into the water that creates one massive ripple that can be felt by almost every single force user. Kreia, after being betrayed by both the Jedi and Sith, began to hate the Force in itself, believing it to be an insidious god, playing a game of balance, using the unaware people of the galaxy who worshipped it. It is said that the Force has a will. It has a destiny for us all. I wield it, but it uses us all, and that is abhorrent to me, because I hate the Force. I hate that it seems to have a will, that it would control us to achieve some measure of balance when countless lives are lost. It was Kreia's intent to use these ripples to deafen the galaxy of the Force. Deafening. Destructive. It touches all life in ways that are invisible to see. The darkness, the despair created from such events breeds and grows. And the wound must be healed. A wound in the Force is something that is an epicentre of mass trauma in which these painful echoes constantly resonate or ripple outward from without ever stopping. Mitra, or the Jedi Exile as she's known, had a skill in creating force bonds, and was connected to so much of the life around Malachor V when she ordered it to be destroyed, and the pain she felt was unimaginable when to escape this. Unlike Nihilus, she unconsciously disconnected herself from the force. And that is why the Mandalorian Wars echo within you still. To hear the Force over such pain, it is not possible. It was too much for any Jedi to endure, and it is a wonder that you did not die there when thousands perished, all those you had fought with and struggled with. You cut yourself off because you had to if you were to survive. Being completely severing her connection to it, a Force wound was created within her, but because she didn't feel the Force in general anymore, she didn't become consumed by it. 
When you returned to us, we saw what had happened. You carry all those deaths at Malachor within you. And it has left a hole, a hunger that cannot be filled. In you, we saw a wound in the Force. In you, we saw the end of the Force. Unlike Nihilus, who was a failure and became completely dependent on the Force, Kreia was fascinated by Mitra, who had simply let go of it completely and utterly and continued to live her life. But she also discovered that if Mitra was killed within the heart of Malachor, the internalised echoes of her Force wound, combined with the echoes of Malachor's wound, would create another wound with an unimaginable Force echo, similar to the one that Mitra felt when she killed so many above Malachor. And as a result, every living thing connected to the Force, like Mitra, would feel it and have to cut themselves off to survive or risk death. Now she seeks to create another echo, a wound in the Force. Greater than the one before, greater than the one you caused, it will deafen all touched by the Force until no life is left. Kreia's goal was to build a galaxy free of the Force, because she didn't want people to die because of it. But at the same time, she was willing to possibly sacrifice billions, maybe even trillions, to do so. The thing is, Kreia didn't want the galaxy to suffer and be enslaved like Nihilus and Sion, but she knew she couldn't defeat them and the rest of the Triumvirate, and inevitably came to realise that she could train Mitra in such a way that she could use her to kill the Sith, fixing her mistakes and gain revenge on those who wronged her. Although her ultimate plan was to kill or deafen the Force, as she travelled with Mitra and found out about the Jedi Masters, her plan adapted. By teaching Mitra to confront and overcome the shadows of her past, from Atris, Duxon, the Jedi Masters, and eventually the monster she created in Nihilus, and ultimately Malachor itself, she would have done what the Jedi couldn't, proving to them that it wasn't her teachings that were to blame for everything that happened in the Mandalorian Wars with Revan, and that it was the Jedi's own failures. And this is what she eventually now wanted. She wanted Mitra to become the foundation for a new Jedi Order. Somebody who wasn't dependent on the Force, but utilised it through Kreia's teachings. Why have you done this? I? Do you think I seek the death of all living things? There is no victory in such things. I do not want to win our war like this, little Jedi. When I win... I wish it to be because I was right, my teachings true. You must understand, I did not wish the Jedi dead. Defeated, perhaps. I merely wished them to see that they and their teachings were wrong. That one could not truly understand the Force simply by adhering to the Jedi Code. All I have ever trained have been failures to them. Students who went to fight the Mandalorians, who fell to the dark side, who abandoned their training. To see one that had the strength to best them, that is a moment I will not forget. But she knew that she couldn't continue, and always intended to test Mitra until the bitter end, to death, to ensure that she truly surpasses her as an apprentice kills the master, knowing in death that the future would be in safe hands. The great thing about this plan was that it was a win-win for Crayon. If her teachings failed, with Mitra falling to the dark side and becoming a failure like Nihilus, she could still deafen the Force by killing her in Malachor, but if Mitra surpassed her in the right way, her teachings would live on and become the foundation for a new Jedi Order, led by somebody who wasn't reliant on the Force and saw the flaws of the Jedi Code. It is done. At last, it is done. You are greater than any I have ever trained. By killing me here, you have rewarded me more than you can possibly know. It is enough what you have done, from now into the future. Many choices were there, but you made the right ones. The beauty of Kreia is that she isn't a villain, really, despite the title. She's been through so much and experienced things so few have, that she wants something that is theoretically going to help and save people's lives. In her eyes, what she's planning to do is a necessary evil. From the moment you awoke, I have used you. I have used you so that you might become strong, stronger than I. I used you to keep the Lords of the Sith from condemning the galaxy to death with their power unchecked. I used you to lure them to Telos, where they could be at last fought and killed. I used you to reveal Atris's corruption so that her teaching could be ended before it began. I used you to gather the Jedi so they could be destroyed. 
and I used you to make those who wounded me reveal themselves so they could be killed by the Republic. But a villain is truly evil, and Kraya isn't evil. She's just disillusioned. And the great thing about her is that she's not one-dimensional. There's so many layers to her personality. She's complex and intriguing, and despite wanting her revenge on so many, she's willing to adapt to her situation depending on how you, the player, proceed through the story. Chris Avalon, Brian Menz, and Sarah Kestelman especially, created one of the most brilliant characters ever, and there's no doubt about that. My only issue was the continuation of Mitra's story, which was, in my opinion, a disservice to Crayon. Everything built in KOTOR 2, the questions it posed, the ideas it brought to the table, the characters it created, were sort of brushed under the mat. It was like they didn't want to acknowledge much of what happened in that story, and kind of twisted it to fit the typical Star Wars view of things. But KOTOR 2 as a story was designed to be different, and it was designed to ask questions of the world George Lucas had created while completely respecting it, and it was a beautiful balance. Anyway, I know it's taken a long while for this one, but I hope you enjoyed it, and that it answered some of your questions that you might have had about what Kreia's motives were. If you did enjoy the video, don't forget to like it, and if you want to see more Knights of the Old Republic content, perhaps subscribe if you haven't so you're always up to date. Also, if you feel like my content, and I deserve it, maybe check out my Patreon page and consider helping to support the channel further, and you get to have a direct impact in how the channel grows. Also, please join my Discord, I'd love to have you there if you haven't joined yet. I'll see you next time, but until then, may the Force be with you. Always.